Welcome to Board Game Binge, the place where we bring you bite-sized, bingeable board game content from across the industry. I'm your host, James Staley, and in this episode, we're chatting with Dave Snyder, the American Director for Sales for Gameland Manufacturing, a full-service board game manufacturer with over 15 years experience in game production. In addition to leading the American team for Gameland, Dave also owns and runs Javelin Dice Works, a custom metal dice supplier in the USA. Dave, welcome to the bench. How are you? Hey, real good. How about you? I am doing awesome. I am even happier that we've been able to navigate some of our technical issues. Uh, for those of you uh, here in, uh, in central Ontario and Canada, uh, we had a massive storm about a week ago, knocked out internet in a lot of uh, communities and especially the one I'm in as well. So, uh, you know, hopefully we get through this whole thing without glitches. It's been crazy. New lines being run from the road and everything. So I think we're good. So Dave, why don't we just start off with how did you get into the board game industry in the first place? Well, it's kind of strange. Uh, ran across this thing you've heard of called Kickstarter. I heard and, of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, anyways, I, uh, I found out that a game that they were making, I was like, well, why can't I buy this? And it's like, then I figured it out and it started dabbling in a little bit to, as a gamer. And at the time, I was like so many people, I had played a lot of video games on a PC for so many years. I was just fatigued out. And I started getting into more board games with my, my sons as they were getting older and doing more of that. But um, at some point, it's kind of weird how it worked. Uh, I run CNC machines uh, for my day job at the time. So I'm thinking at the time, like, hey, I could make some really cool dice. I thought, wouldn't it be nice if they were made out of raw metal? So I started messing around with a little bit. And then I got in touch with a few people on Kickstarter and said, Hey, do you want me to make some metal dice like your dice? And that, that seemed to work pretty well. And I started doing some premium components for a few people here and there. And at some point in that process, I, uh, I had a client that wanted dice, but they also needed their game manufactured. So they were, were going to go to Gen Con and meet with several manufacturers and have face to face time with them. And something came up, he couldn't make it. And he asked me, I definitely want to talk to this company. So is there any way for you to proxy for me and ask him a lot of questions? I said, sure, no problem. So I went ahead and attended the meeting so he didn't have to cancel it. I talked to this representative and uh, we talked over what we had to. And I mentioned my dice and the guy was interested in all that and talking about it a little bit. And it just so happened the day before I was talking to a major publisher, a big one. And they wanted to know if I could run a hundred dice per game and like a oh. hundred thousand games. I said, I can't do that. I mean, it's beyond my capability. Oh yeah. But at the time I thought I didn't want to tell people no. And I thought, you know, they wanted plastic is fine. Maybe I'll just source it for them and give them an option to go through a dice company, you know, to give them that option if all they need is dice. And I asked this guy about, it. he said, sure, we can do that. And I asked him who his U.S. Uh, representative was. He said they didn't have one. And I thought to myself, I was on the fly. I just thought, you probably ought to get one. I, I think that would help your business. And he said, yeah, yeah, okay. And then a few months later, we were talking more dice and I was, you know, getting some quotes for him and stuff. I said, did you ever get a U.S. rep? And he goes, no. And probably about three, four months after that, I get an email that says, would you like to try to be a U.S. rep? And I was like, ah, okay, sure. Why not? You know, it sounds like fun. And I, I entered it in the, the sense that I could take customers that I'd already established connections for dice and networking that I'd already done and uh, maybe use that to pos possibly get uh, a good printer for them. And also, if I get find somebody that wants printing done, then I could have a way to pitch the dice to different people. And I figured that they would piggyback each other and work well. So that's how I got into the manufacturing segment of it is off the dice business. So... And this is one thing I hear from a lot of people when I, you know, talk about, you know, board game production specifically, and they say, you know, can you recommend anybody? And often I'll say, well, why don't, why don't you connect with one of the, the manufacturers out of China? And the amount of anxiety that brings uh, for people in North America, right, that are looking to source out of China, there's just this whole fear factor, right? And saying, okay, you know, they're going to take my money and run. I don't really, it's a foreign country. How do I deal with that? You know, how's it all work? So I think the importance, quite frankly, of having a, uh, a rep here in North America to represent some of these amazing manufacturers, by the way, and they're all very, very good in China. Mm -hmm. 
but having somebody here, just that kind of local connection, I think can help bridge a lot of that gap. Um, so that's pretty, so you were able to get into that. And so that's, is that how you connected to game land then? Was it part of this yes. kind of mm -hmm. introducing yourself and how did yeah. that well, at the time I was just, as I've told you, I was just yeah. taking it on as kind of like uh, something to do while I'm doing the dice. I wasn't taking on as a full-time responsibility. And then several years pass and this company gets larger and larger and they need full-time U.S. representation. Yeah. And like so many people, when you have to make that, that leap of faith, I, w I don't know if I was confident enough in myself to feel like I could represent this company full time. Plus there's, there's, you know, when you leave a, a consistent income earner as your normal day job, yeah. you have to think very hard about that. At the time I was not ready for that commitment. So I did not, pa I passed on that. I didn't, didn't try to do that. Yeah. But then years later I started, what it did is reminded me if I wanted to do it and really get into it and, and really, really support it, and, and do the best I could that it's very possible that I would have to make the full-time commitment. So I started laying the groundwork a few years ahead of time. And then when I felt I was ready and the right opportunity came up, it just hap so happened to be Gameland was that opportunity. So tell me a little bit about uh, Gameland. So how does, is this kind of like, like with Panda Games where the manufacturer is done in China and then, you know, but you're kind of organizing uh, all the communication kind of locally, or can you walk people through kind of how that process works? Okay. Gameland is located in China and it's in Ningbo and uh, Ningbo, Ningbo is very close to Shanghai. Uh, I like to think of it like across the bay, almost like Oakland and San Francisco, but it's a very big bay. So mm -hmm. it's near Shanghai and uh, they have several factories there. And like many of the, if you're, if you start checking into manufacturing all, you'll find out that the Chinese, I wouldn't call it a formula, but what you'll find most of the time is most of these companies will control all their own paper, uh, paper products, do them in-house, do it factories they own, factories they lease. Mm -hmm. You'll find they mostly, all, almost all of them will source out metal and plastic and, plastic and wood. There are, some, uh, there are some ones that don't. They do virtually everything in-house, but generally, the, for the most part, most of them will source your non-paper components, and that's what Gameland will do. Uh, they started out in the poker industry, believe it or not, and they did a lot of poker industry stuff. And then uh, at some point, the CEO, I, I think, oh, then they went into family games and children game, children's games. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the CEO attended this thing called Gen Con, had his eyes blown wide open and said, I, I've got to get in on this and started doing hobby game work. So that's the largest, just like many of the other manufacturers in China, that's one of the biggest growing segments of their business now is the but hobby game market. I think that's something that's important for our listeners to understand is um, it, it's very different than manufacturing in China than, than what we have here in North America, the whole way the model is set up. Uh, and it took me a, a little while to get my head around this myself when I started doing my own manufacturing with my own games. Um, but in the simplest form, um, when you ask someone uh, like a manufacturer in China, can they, if they're a, uh, if say if, like in your example, they do paper production or maybe they make meeples, right? You say, Hey, can you, do you make board games? The answer is always yes, mm -hmm. because maybe their specific factory only does meeples or their specific factory does, you know, miniatures, or maybe their specific factory just does boxes or, or paper. But in that same complex, they're going to have a factory across the street. There's going to be one down mm -hmm. the street. He's going to have a buddy around the corner. They do all these different components. So each manufacturer uh, as a manufacturer also acts as a broker, right? So they're also a manufacturer broker where they will be your kind of single point of contact and they will then farm out all the different pieces to bring that game together. So although, you know, if in this case of his game land or you pick any of the other, you know, prominent game manufacturers in, uh, in China, most of them aren't making all the pieces, right? They're, they're brokering some of those components. Out. Mm -hmm. Some they'll make in house, but they're brokering them out. But having these different relationships, it's much cheaper and I think better to go through one point of contact that does a brokering for you on Chinese soil mm -hmm. than trying to kind of pull together these different components yourself. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That is. Um, keep in mind that I'm not saying every board game, but most board games are generally like 70% plus paper. Right. So, so with these companies that do paper in-house, they're controlling the main the, the, the majority of the items and then sourcing oh, okay. some of the things to add to that. But also I would add this, 
not only myself or my company, but many of the manufacturers that people know well, yeah. they, they do more than just, hey, let's just throw this all in a box. They're, they're usually very good at looking at something as a game, making recommendations, making quality comments. They, they, most of these companies, uh, myself and most of our bigger competitors, uh, they, they do a very good job of helping somebody make a very high quality product. And like I say, making recommendations, because keep in mind that if you're one of the larger companies that are well known, that reflects also upon you as a company. If a game comes out and it sells really well mm -hmm. and wins awards, you're going to print a lot of games. So it's, yeah. it's important to use a manufacturer that if you see something that could be better, advise something that they could add that's a deluxe component, you'll probably try to do that. Um, plus, it means repeat business from that customer. I have many customers come back to me because I made a certain recommendation that really helped their game out. That had really nothing to do with manufacturing, but they respect that yeah. and uh, come back sometimes. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think it's worth noting too, that just uh, is something is, um, you know, I think the word cheap gets used incorrectly in some cases, right? So something could be low cost, right? So your sourcing through China is, is low cost sourcing, not necessarily cheap sourcing, right? So mm -hmm. there's some very high quality uh, production coming out of China. In fact, I would, I would argue there are some of the experts in, in the industry mm -hmm. become the experts in terms of the majority of games are made there. There's a certain level of expertise that comes along with that and reputation that they need to maintain as well, because yeah, I think they're not just doing your game. They might be making a, a you know, a tier one company a game that's, you know, sitting on a shelf at Walmart right now too. Right. So it, 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 you know, think Stegmeier, for instance, you know, a lot of his, uh, his production is done in China as well. So uh, I think it's important to make that distinction that low cost doesn't necessarily mean cheap, right? That's correct. Yes. So for Gameland, so they've been in, in the business for 12 years. Um, what's something that you have brought to the table in kind of becoming that, that North American face for, for Gameland? What, what do you specifically help them with that you, that they didn't really have before? Well, I think, it, and and I kind of didn't, I answered part of your question earlier and didn't sure. finish answering, I guess. So go, I probably cut kind you of going, okay. going back to that. Yeah, there is, there is something about um, someone, at least in the United States, of America, or potentially Canada yeah. or Europe being a little fearful of, yeah. you know, contracting a company and wiring over many thousands of dollars and crossing their fingers that not only will they just receive their product, but it will be good and they won't have problems. Um, that is something that I guess I provide for Gameland. And several people, I think you've talked to several of them uh, within this broadcast yeah. that are in the same boat. They give, they give you that, that familiarity of someone that you could call on the phone during normal you know, U.S. or Canadian, you know, Western Hemisphere hours and talk to yeah. and ask questions or if you have a major problem. That that gets them or any company that has a U.S. or, a, or even in Europe, a European representative. Uh, I believe some other companies do that as well. It gives people a little a little more confidence that things will work out well. Yeah, so, and I, I think some of that expertise. And you know, uh, full disclosure, I, I've I've had Dave and Gameland even uh, you know quote on uh, my most recent game, Naughty Squirrels, that I'm working on, and you know, the advice that you, you provide, I think is invaluable, right? Like take it, for example, we were talking about cards, right? So I had, you know, I want the black core card, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you come and come back saying, okay, but the number that go on a sheet versus the number go on blue core, there's a different kind of configuration there. And that's going to drive your cost up. And Hey, by the way, here's some samples. So you can actually feel the difference between this. Do you really need to go black core or do you think you're going to, you mm -hmm. can get away with blue core things like that, where, you know, as a developer, you're not going to have that knowledge, right? So you're relying on, on the manufacturer to kind of, you know, be that sounding board. And, mm -hmm. and I, I certainly look at the manufacturing relationships that way, that it's not just a, a transactional, um, you know, relationship, but almost an advisory role, right? And maybe you get mm -hmm. the right cost, maybe you don't get the right cost. You know, you have different manufacturers that you're quoting on and some people are going to be better at some things than others, but being able to kind of, you know, fought, ask those questions and, and, and get kind of honest answers back and honest advice, I think is, is invaluable, especially for someone who's new to the industry trying to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, sheet size, it, it may not be one manufacturer superior to the other. It may yeah. be that they use different, 
different uh, sheet stock sizes. For example, a lot of companies print 54 and 55 cards on a sheet. In Black Core, we print 80. Now, if you come to one of those companies, you want 75 cards, there's a loss of efficiency there, whereas that's a lot closer. In fact, I'd probably say, hey, how about if I get to 80 cards for the same price? I mean, it's a lot of times uh, just working with people, listening what they need, and seeing if you can provide some of the best choices. And that doesn't mean you always get chosen, but I think at the end of the day, if you continue to try hard to work for especially, not just publishers, I mean, medium and large publishers, they pretty much know what they want, what they're doing, and they have very good relationships with usually several manufacturers. But what, I, what, what fascinates me most is the small designer that's wanting to put a game on Kickstarter that he's worked on for two years. Mm -hmm. he does, he's not a publisher, but he wants to try to put his game out. He wants to get in print. He probably doesn't even care about how much money he makes, if you make any, but he wants to establish himself and get that game out. I always find those to be the best discussions and I guess points of pride for me when I'm working with a customer. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of advice to be had if you talk to several manufacturing reps. Now, and they're all good. Now, so. MOQ or minimum order quantity is something mm -hmm. that uh, most people should probably get locked in their head. Yes. Right? When they're, mm -hmm. especially if they're doing a Kickstarter, tell us a little, just dumb this down for us, the MOQs and, mm -hmm. and what that means and, and, and why that's important. Okay. So I'm trying to think of, I'm not, there, there are probably some very massive companies out there uh, that print many, many thousand. Uh, I, I think, is it Hasbro that owns the old Milton Bradley? factory here in the united states still Maybe, and their yeah. minimum quantity is huge it's like fifty thousand or something it's it's way up there yeah uh you take those out of the equation and then you have some very good print and play uh print and play uh game crafter kind of places in the united states and elsewhere i'm sure uh that provide smaller quantities uh let's take those out of the equation for now too by the way they all do a really good job for people that are designing a game yeah. But you get in the middle ground. Okay, I, I don't have the next 100,000 copy game. I don't, I want, I want to print more than what I can get from, say, a game crafter or a, a smaller uh, print, print shop. So where do I go? Well, China is a good option. Most of the Chinese manufacturers that I either talk to occasionally at conventions that I know of that have good reputations have an MOQ anywhere from between 500 and 3,000. Right. And, uh, Ours happens to be 500. Uh, we believe in supporting small designers because we know that uh, if we were to print 500 for someone, uh, we make a little bit of money, not much, but we make a little bit of money uh, and it's, they get it, we get a game out there in the market that, has our, that we've printed. Sometimes they have our name on them. And uh, that, that gets the word out that we make good quality games. And also, we all know that there's many designers out there who five years ago, you may not have ever heard of, but now yeah. the designer or the publisher are huge. Well, maybe we get lucky and they, we work with them when they're young and developing and they come to appreciate, respect us. They know us very well. And maybe they might have the next big, um, big uh, award winner. So we never know. So we work with everybody. So most and, Kickstarters, just to jump in there, I'd say most Kickstarters are, Typically uh, in the board game industry, typically somewhere between 150 and a thousand backers, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. when you're thinking about that, where, you know, you're, unless you get one of these ones that just take off and, and, and go, mm -hmm. go crazy. And we've interviewed a lot of people on the show that have had some very large Kickstarters, mm -hmm. but typically if somebody's new to starting out, especially in the industry, uh, they're looking for advice, they're doing their Kickstarter for the first time. You hit 500, 750 backers, you're pretty happy, right? So when it comes to minimum order quantities, um, you kind of need a manufacturer that's willing to do 500 to a thousand games as kind of, you know, a good starting order to fulfill the Kickstarter. If you're with the manufacturers forcing you to make 5,000 games, right. Um, and you only have 750 backers. Well, what are you doing with the rest of those games? Now you got to pay for storage. You mm -hmm. got to try to figure out how to fulfill them try to find out some retail outlets to send them. Maybe you pick away at it uh, on Amazon over time, but the storage of those games is going to chip away at your profits over time, right? So if you can kind of make to what you need, if your intention is just to do primarily Kickstarter, you're always going to be better off. And even if it involves you paying a little bit more per item, mm -hmm. that's a trap I think a lot of people run into where they'll they'll get a quote and uh, you know, the manufacturer will say, well, hey, if you do 2,000, 
you know, I can cut your price in half per unit. Well, yeah, that, that, that's great. But then I'm sitting on maybe a thousand games that it might take me a couple of years to get rid of. And I might chew up all those savings and in, in storage fees over that time. Mm-hmm. So, that's true. Um, you know, in my mind, I think if, especially if there's somebody new starting out, man, if you can get in around 500 as your starting point and work your costing on that. And if you can make your, the financials of your Kickstarter work at 500, I think you're, you're in good shape because then if you exceed that, I mean, your Kickstarter, your production isn't necessarily going to start until a couple months after your Kickstarter closes. Anyways, you can always increase the number, right? Yes. You can always re, you know, realize those savings by adding more games onto your production run. But you got to make the math work at 500 first. We, 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 I like to think, I like to think that the 500 is a great safety net. Yeah. I, I will say when I, when I price, when I price most games out and you go from 500 to a thousand to 1500, the savings are, are there. Trust me, they're there. Um, but the way I've always looked at it is if you can look at 500 and say, what do I have to put as my pledge goal based on say 500 yeah. versus another company at 1500, a thousand, all of a sudden you can suppress that pledge goal fund very early and now you have that safety net is if if i only sell 200 or 300 or if i only get two or 300 backers they're actually getting this physical board game i have that safety net there whereas if you only get a quote with uh a thousand or 1500 uh to be honest with you those quotes that you get from the companies that may not quote 500 like us they're going to be very fair prices at that um it's there there's nothing wrong they are just looking at uh, a different set of um i don't know parameters about what they want to produce and how they're built to run as far as manufacturing. But um, yeah, if you go with the one that has a thousand or 1500 odds are you'll be okay, but you definitely probably need to set that pledge goal higher yeah. because at the end of the day, they're not going to print any less than a thousand for you, let's say. Yeah. So you have to set that pledge goal up higher. Whereas if you have a quote um, and the same thing applies, if you think you're going to sell two or 3000 uh, nothing wrong with getting a quote from one of the companies that only does a thousand up. Yeah. That will help you. That'll give you that floor. So, and now you guys do, do miniatures as well, right? Oh so yeah. Not just all mm-hmm. game, but the miniatures, I think I saw on your website, you called it uh plastic crack. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's my, I have somebody that helps me here in the United States. Um, he's my, uh, <laughs> he's, he's a guy that I uh, did a lot of work with, with metal dice and also getting his game printed yeah. before I came on board with game land. And uh, I kind of tagged him and said, uh, you know, I, I could probably use a little help here because there's a lot of a lot of uh, business here. So he's kind of doing the part time gig like I did when I started out sure. and I asked him to help me with the web design. And he did a lot of that. And, yeah, he called it plastic, plastic crack. crack. He, I tell you, well, like, Kickstarter, good right? people love their minis. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's funny. Um, and then can you talk a little bit about uh, timelines? Because uh, there is some uh, navigation you have to do when you're manufacturing in China, specifically around mm-hmm. the beginning of the year. Can you explain a little bit about that? Okay, there's a lot there, but I'll try to unpack it as fast as possible. Sure. Um, you, what you want to find out is what everybody's lead time is, how long it takes for them to manufacture, and also to find out where you fit into that queue. So if somebody says that, hey, we can manufacture a game in 45 days, uh, you'll say 45 days from what? And usually it has to do with your art submission. And what happens is you submit art, and then they say, well, there's this problem, this problem, we need to fix this, there's that. You go back and forth. It usually takes a week, maybe a week and a half, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little less, but figure on a week, week or two to get your art submitted. Once that's done, then they start setting it up and, you know, standard run for a non non plastic miniature game is somewhere between 35 and say 60 days for most companies. But that doesn't mean that they can run that product the minute you do that, they may have a queue that's built up to that you have to get into. So you have to ask them, okay, when can I expect this? Some companies uh, to their credit are very, very successful. And you may have to wait in a long queue to get your game printed, even though you're ready to print it. So then you have Chinese new year is another thing, right? Yep. That's the next thing. Well, actually I'll, I'll bring that up last. Then you have your shipping. So you have to actually figure on assuming you want to ship your games out of China and you want to ship them on sea freight, then you're looking at three to five weeks for that to take place. And then finally you have several holidays that will uh, interfere with your plans. One of them is golden week. Uh, That, that takes a week, but figure on a week and a half because 
uh, like we do, at least in the United States, a lot of people group their, uh, their days off around the holidays. So it extends it a little bit for them. Okay. And then Chinese new year, it just depends on what year it is. It varies the time it starts, the time it ends. But one thing is for sure is that if you want to talk about the actual manufacturing of your product, uh, you can figure on at least four weeks during eh, late January to early February to late February to early March that you really are not going to see any manufacturing done. It's a two week holiday, but people uh, tend to uh, go. It's, it's the time when many people in China that have migrated to the large cities Mm -hmm. that produce board games, they will go back into central China to visit their families. And that's the only time they get to see their family. So we have to respect it. But at the same time, you can count on a, a full month of manufacturing not being done. When is as Golden far as, Week? I don't have a calendar handy. Is it the fall I, or like what, what, what? It's in the fall. I couldn't yeah. tell you exactly what it is. I think I it's just passed though, first right? Week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a week yeah. there. And like I say, figure on a week and a half the way it works. And then depending on the company, the manufacturer you're working with, yeah. uh, our manufacturer, for example, last year, if it were not for Corona, we would have been shut down for one week or two weeks from the perspective of working uh, to get your R uploaded, to get your quoting done. Yeah. Uh, the, when I say manufacturing, I mean the physical production of your board game mm -hmm. will shut down for a month. But many of the companies still uh, work. Uh, they work the work as much as they can through the through the Chinese New Year. Uh, for business. So from my own personal experience, what I would say is it's almost like a buzzer goes off and everybody drops their stuff and they don't mm -hmm. pick it up for four more weeks. Like it is, um, like you said, they are literally leaving the city, right. And, mm -hmm. and, and going potentially to another province to, to, to visit family. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, it's not like North America where you can say, Hey, is there somebody you can maybe just have, just kind of shoot over to the line or just look something up like, like the building's empty, <laughs> like people leave and they don't, you know, they don't come back for four weeks. So it was a little bit of a culture shock for me. Uh, certainly uh, any kind of uh, manufacturing I do, I make sure I plan around that. I try to avoid January, February in general uh, mm -hmm. when I'm doing any manufacturing in China, just for that, that very reason. So um, I know, I know we're yeah. probably coming up short on time, but I wanted to add one thing to that. Sure. What not only just the four weeks, but if you're going to get a board game made, that's something you should consider right ahead of time to plan around it. Not only just yeah. will it be manufactured in time, but there's a lot of other things that your manufacturer, whoever you're talking to, will talk to you about. But it takes a lot of planning to work around that as well. So there's a couple of people just in our, our chat lobby here that are uh, watching the interview, uh, you know. Mike, Ms. Bruner was asking about uh, just where it was manufactured, just so we're clear again, the manufacturing facility is in China. Uh, yes. Robert uh, Geislinger, uh, a big fan of yours, uh, obviously. Uh, he did ask a question though. He said, you know, are your miniatures uh, produced uh, in China as well? Or are they done domestically? Yes. There was some confusion around that. Okay, so they yes. are made in China as well. Yeah. Which makes sense because you kind of want them to go across the street and into the box instead of being kind of shipped from one country to the next, I guess, right? That would be yeah. efficient probably. Yeah, we've we've had some, yeah. we've had actually, I've shipped some dice to China um, to be packed into the product. But generally speaking, uh, that's the rarity. Typically, they'll source what they need. Awesome. And just really quickly on the javelin, because I, I don't want to, I'd be remiss if I don't bring up the fact that we're going to do a giveaway on your javelin custom dice in mm -hmm. uh, I think about two weeks where uh, a lucky member of the board game binge uh, Facebook group will get to uh, get a set of custom dice that they'll, you know, they'll give you their graphics and you're going to create some actual custom yeah. uh, metal dice from, which I think is. Uh, yeah. James, you went, you went through the process with me. It's pretty yeah. simple. Um, it's super and, simple. Yeah. Yep. And you just uh, upload what you need to me and we make metal dice. It's, it's 60, 61 anodized aluminum. So it's a very common anodized type product, but they're dice. Yeah. Um, and it's not, some people sell like uh, a lot of companies will do like pips on one through five and stuff. No, this is all custom icons. Anything that anything goes, I actually did for one of my customers. I did a GameCube as a Kickstarter. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. There were little game cubes in the color in the limited edition colors they had. So you can do about anything with it. And sorry, Robert did have one more question here. So he's saying just for clarity around the outsourcing, he's wondering if the miniatures, are you guys the miniature producers or do you outsource to one of your partners in China? We have, a, we have, a, we have three or four plastic miniature suppliers. Mm. And depending on what the customer uh, wants for quality, for material, then we choose 
what manufacturer will best provide that. So it makes sense. And there, size there's a lot too, there's right? yeah, right. And there's variation in virtually uh, typically not the wood components, but definitely in the plastics and things like that. Um, there are some companies that, that may have a higher price level, but they have a higher end uh, product. Minis are a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. There's several different levels, if you will, of minis, depending on somebody, what somebody needs. If they're going to put, you know, if it's like risk where they're going to put, you know, five, you know, a hundred of the same thing and they need, you know, then in that case, then you may go with more an ec- economical plastic supplier, mm-hmm. uh, lower price, uh, significant, you know, some low, lower quality. So we okay. have levels of options that way. Uh, and I think it's important to note too, with, if anybody is out there quoting out, um, you know, miniatures as part of their game, which again, it's the plastic crack, right. Uh, for Kickstarter, mm-hmm. um, is to, to be mindful of, of mold costs too, right? Because there's, there's two costs. There's your cost per mini, and there's also your mold cost and that mold cost, uh, which are usually in the thousands, um, you're going to have to kind of prorate that over uh, the number of games you're producing. And that's going to come up with a number that, um, although it is technically uh, a one-time uh, fee, but if you're only doing one run of your games, then that becomes Gen- unit generally cost. speaking, almost all the customers that I work with will print something one time, maybe twice, but usually just one time. Mm-hmm. And what I always tell them is take all your tooling Add your tooling, your setup, any of that, add it all up, yeah. divide it by the number of games you're making, and then add that in to know your true cost. Yeah. Dice are a perfect example. Sometimes we will build a mold. Sometimes we'll use a different process where the unit cost of the dice are higher, but you don't have to really pay a, a setup fee. And then sometimes you run so many dice that that would be crazy and you end up building a mold because the mold price is high, but the unit cost drops. And when we run quotes, and I'm sure all the other companies do as well, they look at that number and figure out what's the best for the customer. So, so if someone wants to uh, get Gameland to quote on their next uh, their next board game or, or or start that kind of conversation, how best do they do that? How do, how best do they reach out to you? Just probably best to go to the web page, fill out the RFQ form there, okay. get it directly to us, and then we'll look at it. And uh, usually, I get back with a customer within hours and say, hey, we're we're gonna you know, I have a question about this item or that item. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we will, uh, like I say, we'll send that to a quotation team. Uh, they look at it. The project manager gets assigned to that project and then they start working through it, checking everything. They send it through a quotation team. Um, and then eventually it's all gets wrapped back up, sent back to me or directly to the customer. And then they know where we stand. So that URL would be gamelandus.com. So gameland us.com mm-hmm. and if yep. you go to the website so that's the u.s version of the website they have a chinese version yep, but yep. it's yep it's they're, ones, they're in recons- English, ones in chinese so yes go you to the can US go one. there the, yeah just change the u.s to cn and you can go to the where their website yeah. i do believe it's under construction they are re redoing it right now but yeah. um you know that i believe they have a link there that you could talk to them directly or like yeah. i say you can you can uh talk to us as well yeah. So all the information you need is there. Uh, it's, I mean, you can see exactly all the types of components and so forth that Dave can help you with. And then Dave, if they want to reach out to you regarding um, Javelin Dice Works, how, how best do they do that? Uh, just go to javelindice.com. Javelindice.com. And uh, there they can, I guess, fill out an RFQ form as well, or is it there, right? Yeah. I've just, right now I'm, I'm changing that website actually. So okay. right now I've just got it. I've got an email, just email me just like we did our dice. It's pretty simple process and we'll just go from there. I'm, I'm, gra- I'm migrating it over from a regular, just a standard, very basic landing page mm-hmm. to an actual pay site where I can actually, uh, you can fill out a request for an order. Um, my son has worked on for for a couple of years, I just haven't implemented it yet because it kind of scares me, but he has a program where you can literally upload designs, rotate the die in 3d, make oh, a purchase cool. and then they get made. But like I said, that that's coming. So I've uh, started migrating over to a pay site where I can make that kind of thing happen. And also uh, the different sets that I make, I make sets for like hostage negotiator and deep space D six. Oh, and I cool. make some unofficial dice, like for, for uh, um, hero quest and stuff like that. Eventually those will all go up there as well. So you can buy dice that are the, that you know and recognize that are already made. So if you want to pimp out your game, then you can get some custom dice there. Exactly. Game. Yep. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. It has been educational. I'm sure uh, people learned quite a bit about the manufacturing process in China 
and what Gameland has to offer. So thanks again for your time and uh, you take care. Appreciate it. Take care. Cheers. This has been an episode of the Board Game Binge podcast, hosted by James Staley, produced by James Staley and Mike Bruner, with original music by Nick Smith. If you would like to watch these interviews live, simply join the Facebook group Board Game Binge, and you'll get access to live interviews, giveaways, and interesting board game content from across the industry. I can't wait for you to join us. See you next time.